Chapter 41 328 Was going down, they took us in, telling us that this had come to us through our incivility and not giving them an answer. Our renegade took the trunk containing Zoraida's wealth and dropped it into the sea without anyone perceiving what he did. In short we went on board with the Frenchmen who after having ascertained all they wanted to know about us, rifled us of everything we had, as if they had been our bitterest enemies, and from Zoraida they took even the anklets she wore on her feet. But the distress they caused her did not distress me so much as the fear I was in that from robbing her of her rich and precious jewels they would proceed to rob her of the most precious jewel that she valued more than all. The desires, however, of those people do not go beyond money, but of that their covetousness is insatiable, and on this occasion it was carried to such a pitch that they would have taken. Even the clothes we wore as captives if they had been worth anything to them. It was the advice of some of them to throw us all into the sea wrapped up in a sail, for their purpose was to trade at some of the ports of Spain, giving themselves out as Bretons, and if they brought us alive they would be punished as soon as the robbery was discovered but the captain, who was the one who had plundered my beloved Zoraida, said he was satisfied with the prize he had got, and that he would not touch at any Spanish port, but pass the Straits of Gibraltar by night, or as best he could, and make for La Rochelle, from which he had sailed. So they agreed by common consent to give us the skiff belonging to their ship and all we required for the short voyage that remained to us, and this they did the next day on coming in sight of the Spanish coast, with which, and the joy we felt, all our sufferings and miseries were as completely forgotten as if they had never been endured by us, such as the delight of recovering lost liberty. It may have been about mid-minus day when they placed us in the boat, giving us two kegs of water and some biscuit, and the captain, moved by I know not what compassion, as the lovely Zoraida was about to embark, gave her some forty gold crowns, and would not permit his men to take from her those same garments which she has on now. We got into the boat, returning them thanks for their kindness to us, and showing ourselves grateful rather than indignant. They stood out to sea, steering for the straits, we, without looking to any compass save the land we had before us, set ourselves to row with such energy that by sunset we were so near that we might easily, we thought, land before the night was far advanced. But as the moon did not show that night, and the sky was clouded, and as we knew not whereabouts we were, it did not seem to us a prudent thing to make for the shore, as several of us advised. Saying we ought to run ourselves ashore even if it were on rocks and far from any habitation. For in this way we should be relieved from the apprehensions we naturally felt of the prowling vessels of the Tetuan corsairs, who leave Barbary at nightfall and are on the Spanish coast by daybreak, where they commonly take some prize, and then go home to sleep in their own houses. But of the conflicting counsels, the one which was adopted was that we should approach gradually and land where we could if the sea were calm enough to permit us. This was done, and a little before midnight we drew near to the foot of a huge and lofty mountain, not so close to the sea, but that it left a narrow space on which to land conveniently. We ran our boat up on the sand, and all sprang out and kissed the ground, and with tears of joyful satisfaction returned thanks to God our Lord for all his incomparable. Don Quixote Chapter 41 329 Goodness to us on our voyage we took out of the boat the provisions it contained, and drew it up on the shore, and then climbed a long way up the mountain, for even there we could not feel easy in our hearts, or persuade ourselves that it was Christian soil that was now under our feet. The dawn came, more slowly, I think, than we could have wished, we completed the ascent in order to see if from the summit any habitation or any shepherd's huts could be discovered, but strain our eyes as we might, neither dwelling, nor human being, nor path nor road could we perceive. However, we determined to push on farther as it could not, but be that ere long we must see someone who could tell us where we were. But what distressed me most was to see Zoraida going on foot over that rough ground, for though I once carried her on my shoulders, she was more wearied by my weariness than rested by the rest, and so she would never again allow me to undergo the exertion, and went on very patiently and cheerfully, while I led her by the hand. We had gone rather less than a quarter of a league when the sound of a little bell fell on our ears, a clear proof that there were flocks hard by, and looking about carefully to see if any were within view, we observed a young shepherd. Tranquilly and unsuspiciously trimming a stick with his knife at the foot of a cork tree. We called to him, and he, raising his head, sprang nimbly to his feet, for, as we afterwards learned, the first who presented themselves to his sight were the renegade and Zoraida, and seeing them in Moorish dress he imagined that all the Moors of Barbary were upon him and plunging with marvelous swiftness into the thicket in front of him, he began to raise a prodigious outcry, exclaiming, The Moors minus the Moors have landed. To arms, to arms. We were all thrown into perplexity by these cries, not knowing what to do, 
but reflecting that the shouts of the shepherd would raise the country, and that the mounted coast minus guard would come at once to see what was the matter, we agreed that the renegade must strip off his Turkish garments and put on a captive's jacket or coat which one of our party gave him at once, though he himself was reduced to his shirt, and so commending ourselves to God, we followed the same road which we saw the shepherd take, expecting every moment that the coast minus guard would be down upon us. Nor did our expectation deceive us, for two hours had not passed when, coming out of the brushwood into the open ground, we perceived some fifty mounted men swiftly approaching us at a hand minus gallop. As soon as we saw them we stood still, waiting for them, but as they came close and, instead of the moors they were in quest of, saw a set of poor Christians, they were taken aback, and one of them asked if it could be we who were the cause of the shepherd having raised the call to arms. I said yes, and as I was about to explain to him what had occurred, and whence we came, and who we were, one of the Christians of our party recognized the horseman who had put the question to us, and before I could say anything more he exclaimed. Thanks be to God, sirs, for bringing us to such good quarters, for, if I do not deceive myself, the ground we stand on is that of Valles Malaga unless, indeed, all my years of captivity have made me unable to recollect that you, senor, who ask who we are, are Pedro de Bustamante, my uncle. Don Quixote Chapter 41 330 The Christian captive had hardly uttered these words, when the horseman threw himself off his horse, and ran to embrace the young man, crying, Nephew of my soul and life, I recognize thee now, and long have I mourned thee as dead, I, and my sister, thy mother, and all thy kin that are still alive, and whom God has been pleased to preserve that they may enjoy the happiness of seeing thee. We knew long since that thou wert in Algiers, and from the appearance of thy garments and those of all this company, I conclude that ye have had a miraculous restoration to liberty. It is true, replied the young man, and by minus and minus by we will tell you all. As soon as the horsemen understood that we were Christian captives, they dismounted from their horses, and each offered his to carry us to the city of Valles Malaga, which was a league and a half distant. Some of them went to bring the boat to the city, we having told them where we had left it, others took us up behind them, and Zoraida was placed on the horse of the young man's uncle. The whole town came out to meet us, for they had by this time heard of our arrival from one who had gone on in advance. They were not astonished to see liberated captives or captive moors, for people on that coast are well used to see both one and the other, but they were astonished at the beauty of Zoraida, which was just then heightened, as well by the exertion of traveling as by joy at finding herself on Christian soil, and relieved of all fear of being lost, for this had brought such a glow upon her face, that unless my affection for her were deceiving me, I would venture to say that there was not a more beautiful creature in the world minus at least, that I had ever seen. We went straight to the church to return thanks to God for the mercies we had received, and when Zoraida entered it she said there were faces there like Lella Marines. We told her they were her images, and as well as he could the renegade explained to her what they meant, that she might adore them as if each of them were the very same Lella Marine that had spoken to her, and she, having great intelligence and a quick and clear instinct, understood at once all he said to her about them. Thence they took us away and distributed us all in different houses in the town, but as for the renegade, Zoraida, and myself, the Christian who came with us brought us to the house of his parents, who had a fair share of the gifts of fortune, and treated us with as much kindness as they did their own son. We remained six days in Valles, at the end of which the renegade, having informed himself of all that was requisite for him to do, set out for the city of Granada to restore himself to the sacred bosom of the church through the medium of the Holy Inquisition. The other released captives took their departures, each the way that seemed best to him, and Zoraida and I were left alone, with nothing more than the crowns which the courtesy of the Frenchman had bestowed upon Zoraida, out of which I bought the beast on which she rides, and I for the present attending her as her father and squire and not as her husband, we are now going to ascertain if my father is living, or if any of my brothers has had better fortune than mine has been though as. Heaven has made me the companion of Zoraida, I think no other lot could be assigned to me however happy, that I would rather have. The Patience Don Quixote Chapter 41 331 With which she endures the hardships that poverty brings with it, and the eagerness she shows to become a Christian, are such that they fill me with admiration, and bind me to serve her all my life, though the happiness I feel in seeing myself hers, and her mine, is disturbed and marred by not knowing whether I shall find any corner to shelter her in my own country, or whether time and death may not have made such changes in the fortunes and lives of my father and brothers, that I shall. Hardly find anyone who knows me, if they are not alive. I have no more of my story to tell you, gentlemen. Whether it be an interesting, or a curious one let your better judgments decide, 
All I can say is I would gladly have told it to you more briefly, although my fear of worrying you has made me leave out more than one circumstance. Don Quixote Chapter 41 332 Chapter 42 Which treats of what further took place in the inn and of Several other things worth knowing. With these words the captive held his peace, and Don Fernando said to him, In truth, Captain, the manner in which you have related this remarkable adventure has been such as befitted the novelty and strangeness of the matter. The whole story is curious and uncommon, and abounds with incidents that fill the hearers with wonder and astonishment, and so great is the pleasure we have found in listening to it that we should be glad if it were to begin again, even though to minus Morrow were to find us still occupied with the same tale. And while he said this Cardinio and the rest of them offered to be of service to him in any way that lay in their power, and in words and language so kindly and sincere that the captain was much gratified by their good minus will. In particular Don Fernando offered, if he would go back with him, to get his brother the Marquis to become godfather at the baptism of Zoraida, and on his own part to provide him with the means of making his appearance in his own country with the credit and comfort he was entitled to. For all this the captive returned. Thanks very courteously, although he would not accept any of their generous offers. By this time night closed in, and as it did, there came up to the inn a coach attended by some men on horseback, who demanded accommodation, to which the landlady replied that there was not a hand's breadth of the hole and unoccupied. Still, for all that, said one of those who had entered on horseback, room must be found for his lordship the judge here. At this name the landlady was taken aback and said, Senor, the fact is I have no beds, but if his lordship the judge carries one with him, as no doubt he does, let him come in and welcome for my husband, and I will give up our room to accommodate his worship. Very good, so be it, said the squire, but in the meantime a man had got out of the coach whose dress indicated at a glance the office and post he held, for the long robe with ruffled sleeves that he wore showed that he was, as his servant said, a judge of appeal. He led by the hand a young girl in a traveling dress, apparently about sixteen years of age, and of such a high minus bred air, so beautiful and so graceful, that all were filled with admiration when she made her appearance, and but for having seen Dorothea, Lucinda, and Zoraida, who were there in the inn, they would have fancied that a beauty like that of this maiden's would have been hard to find. Don Quixote was present at the entrance of the judge with the young lady, and as soon as he saw him he said, Your worship may with confidence enter and take your ease in this castle, for though the accommodation be scanty and poor, there. Don Quixote Chapter 42-333 are no quarters so cramped or inconvenient that they cannot make room for arms and letters, above all if arms and letters have beauty for a guide and leader, as letters represented by your worship have in this fair maiden, to whom not only ought castles to throw themselves open and yield themselves up, but rocks should rend themselves asunder and mountains divide and bow themselves down to give her a reception. Enter, your worship, I say, into this paradise, for here you will find stars and suns to accompany the heaven your worship brings with you, here you will find arms in their supreme excellence and beauty in its highest perfection. The judge was struck with amazement at the language of Don Quixote, whom he scrutinized very carefully, no less astonished by his figure than by his talk, and before he could find words to answer him he had a fresh surprise, when he saw opposite to him Lucinda, Dorothea, and Zoraida, who having heard of the new guests, and of the beauty of the young lady, had come to see her and welcome her, Don Fernando, Cardinio, and the curate however, greeted him in a more intelligible and polished style. In short, the judge made his entrance in a state of bewilderment, as well with what he saw as what he heard, and the fair ladies of the inn gave the fair damsel a cordial welcome. On the whole he could perceive that all who were there were people of quality, but with the figure, countenance, and bearing of Don Quixote he was at his wit's end, and all civilities having been exchanged and the accommodation of the inn inquired into, it was settled, as it had been before settled. That all the women should retire to the garret that has been already mentioned, and that the Men should remain outside as if to guard them, the judge, therefore, was very well pleased to allow his daughter, for such the damsel was, to go with the ladies, which he did very willingly, and with part of the host's narrow bed and half of what the judge had brought with him, they made a more comfortable arrangement for the night than they had expected. The captive, whose heart had leaped within him the instant he saw the judge, telling him somehow that this was his brother, asked one of the servants who accompanied him what his name was, and whether he knew from what part of the country he came. The servant replied that he was called the licentiate Juan Perez de Viedma, and that he had heard it said he came from a village in the mountains of Leon. 
From this statement and what he himself had seen, he felt convinced that this was his brother who had adopted letters by his father's advice, and excited and rejoiced, he called Don Fernando and Cardinio and the curate aside, and told them how the matter stood, assuring them that the judge was his brother. The servant had further informed him that he was now going to the Indies with the appointment of judge of the Supreme Court of Mexico, and he had learned, likewise, that the young lady was his daughter, whose mother had died in giving birth to her, and that he was very rich in consequence of the dowry left to him with the daughter. He asked there. Advice as to what means he should adopt to make himself known, or to ascertain beforehand whether, when he had made himself known, his brother, seeing him so poor, would be ashamed of him, or would receive him with a warm heart. Don Quixote Chapter 42-334 Leave it to me to find out that, said the curate, though there is no reason for supposing, senior captain, that you will not be kindly received, because the worth and wisdom that your brother's bearing shows him to possess do not make it likely that he will prove haughty or insensible, or that he will not know how to estimate the accidents of fortune at their proper value. Still, said the captain, I would not make myself known abruptly, but in some indirect way. I have told you already, said the curate, that I will manage it in a way to satisfy us all. By this time supper was ready, and they all took their seats at the table, except the captive, and the ladies, who supped by themselves in their own room. In the middle of supper the curate said, I had a comrade of your worship's name, Senor Judge, in Constantinople, where I was a captive for several years, and that same comrade was one of the stoutest soldiers and captains in the whole Spanish infantry, but he had as large a share of misfortune as he had of gallantry and courage. And how was the captain called, Senor? asked the judge. He was called Rui Perez de Viedma, replied the curate, and he was born in a village in the mountains of Leon, and he mentioned a circumstance connected with his father and his brothers which, had it not been told me by so truthful a man as he was, I should have set down as one of those fables the old women tell over the fire in winter, for he said his father had divided his property among his three sons and had addressed words of advice to them sounder than any of Cato's. But I can say this much, that the choice he made of going to the wars was attended with such success, that by his gallant conduct and courage, and without any help save his own merit, he rose in a few years to be captain of infantry, and to see himself on the high minus road and in position to be given the command of a corps before long, but fortune was against him, for where he might have expected her favor he lost it, and with it his liberty, on that glorious day when so many recovered theirs, at the Battle of Lepanto. I lost mine at the Galetta, and after a variety of adventures we found ourselves comrades at Constantinople. Thence he went to Algiers where he met with one of the most extraordinary adventures that ever befell anyone in the world. Here the curate went on to relate briefly his brother's adventure with Zoraida, to all which the judge gave such an attentive hearing that he never before had been so much of a hearer. The curate, however, only went so far as to describe how the Frenchman plundered those who were in the boat, and the poverty and distress in which his comrade and the fair Moor were left, of whom he said he had not been able to learn what became of them, or. Don Quixote Chapter 42-335 Whether they had reached Spain or been carried to France by the Frenchman. The captain, standing a little to one side, was listening to all the curate said, and watching every movement of his brother who, as soon as he perceived the curate had made an end of his story, gave a deep sigh and said with his eyes full of tears, Oh, senor, if you only knew what news you have given me, and how it comes home to me making me show how I feel it with these tears that spring from my eyes in spite of all my worldly wisdom and self-minus restraint. That brave captain that you speak of is my eldest brother, who, being of a bolder and loftier mind than my other brother or myself, chose the honorable and worthy calling of arms, which was one of the three careers our father proposed to us, as your comrade mentioned in that fable you thought he was telling you. I followed that of letters in which God and my own exertions have raised me to the position in which you see me. My second brother is in Peru so wealthy that with what he has sent to my father and to me he has fully repaid the portion he took with him, and has even furnished my father's hands with the means of gratifying his natural generosity, while I too have been enabled to pursue my studies in a more becoming and creditable fashion, and so to attain my present standing. My father is still alive, though dying with anxiety to hear of his eldest son, and he prays God unceasingly that death may not close his eyes until he has looked upon those of his son but with regard to him what surprises me is, that having so much common sense as he had, he should have neglected to give any intelligence about himself, either in his troubles and sufferings, or in his prosperity, for if his father or any of us had known of his condition he need not have waited for that. 
Miracle of the Reed to obtain his ransom, but what now disquiets me is the uncertainty whether those Frenchmen may have restored him to liberty, or murdered him to hide the robbery. All this will make me continue my journey, not with the satisfaction in which I began it, but in the deepest melancholy and sadness. Oh dear! Brother! That I only knew where thou art now, and I would hasten to seek thee out and deliver thee from thy sufferings, though it were to cost me suffering myself. Oh that I could bring news to our old father that thou art alive, even wert thou the deepest dungeon of Barbary, for his wealth and my brothers and mine would rescue thee thence. O oh, beautiful and generous Zoraida, that I could repay thy good goodness to a brother! That I could be present at the new birth of thy soul, and at thy bridal that would give us all such happiness! All this and more the judge uttered with such deep emotion at the news he had received of his brother, that all who heard him shared in it, showing their sympathy with his sorrow. The curate seeing then, how well he had succeeded in carrying out his purpose and the captain's wishes, had no desire to keep them unhappy any longer, so he rose from the table, and going into the room where Zoraida was he took her by the hand, Lucinda, Dorothea, and the judge's daughter following her. The captain was waiting to see what the curate would do, when the latter, taking him with the other hand, advanced with both of them to where the judge and the other gentlemen were and said, Let your tears cease to flow, send your judge, and the wish of your heart be gratified as fully as you could desire, for you have before you your worthy brother, and your good sister minus in minus law. He whom you see here is the Captain Viedma, and this is the fair Moor who has been so good to him. The Frenchman I. Don Quixote. Chapter 42 336. Told you of have reduced them to the state of poverty you see that you may show the generosity of your kind heart. The captain ran to embrace his brother, who placed both hands on his breast so as to have a good look at him, holding him a little way off, but as soon as he had fully recognized him he clasped him in his arms so closely, shedding such tears of heartfelt joy, that most of those present could not but join in them. The words the brothers exchanged, the emotion they showed can scarcely be imagined, I fancy, much less put down in writing. They told each other in a few words the events of their lives, they showed the true affection of brothers in all its strength, then the judge embraced Zoraida, putting all he possessed at her disposal, then he made his daughter embrace her, and the fair Christian, and the lovely Moor drew fresh tears from every eye. And there was Don Quixote observing all these strange proceedings attentively without uttering a word, and attributing the whole to chimeras of night minus errantry. Then they agreed that the captain and Zoraida should return with his brother to Seville, and send news to his father of his having been delivered and found, so as to enable him to come and be present at the marriage and baptism of Zoraida, for it was impossible for the judge to put off his journey, as he was informed that in a month from that time the fleet was to sail from Seville for New Spain, and to miss the passage would have been a great inconvenience to him. In short, everybody was well pleased and glad at the captive's good fortune, and as now almost two minus thirds of the night were passed, they resolved to retire to rest for the remainder of it. Don Quixote offered to mount guard over the castle lest they should be attacked by some giant or other malevolent scoundrel, covetous of the great treasure of beauty the castle contained. Those who understood him returned him thanks for this service, and they gave the judge an account of his extraordinary humor, with which he was not a little amused. Sancho Panza alone was fuming at the lateness of the hour for retiring to rest, and he of all was the one that made himself most comfortable, as he stretched himself on the trappings of his ass, which, as will be told farther on, cost him so dear. The ladies then, having retired to their chamber, and the others having disposed themselves with as little discomfort as they could, Don Quixote sallied out of the inn to act as sentinel of the castle as he had promised. It happened, however, that a little before the approach of dawn a voice so musical and sweet reached the ears of the ladies that it forced them all to listen attentively, but especially Dorothea, who had been awake, and by whose side Dona Clara de Viedma, for so the judge's daughter was called, lay sleeping. No one could imagine who it was that sang so sweetly, and the voice was unaccompanied by any instrument. At one moment it seemed to them as if the singer were in the courtyard, at another in the stable, and as they were all attention, wondering, Cardinio came to the door and said, Listen, whoever is not asleep, and you will hear a muleteer's voice that enchants as it chants. We are li listening to it already, senor, said Dorothea, on which Cardinio went away, and Dorothea, giving all her attention to it, made out the words of the song to be these. Don Quixote Chapter 42 337 Chapter 43 W. Herein is related the pleasant story of the muleteer, together with other strange things that came to pass in the inn. 
Ami, love's mariner am I on love's deep ocean sailing. I know not where the haven lies, I dare not hope to gain it. One solitary distant star is all I have to guide me, a brighter orb than those of old that Palinurus lighted. And vaguely drifting am I born, I know not where it leads me, I fix my gaze on it alone, of all beside it heedless. But over minus cautious prudery, and coyness cold and cruel, when most I need it, these, like clouds, its longed minus four light refuse me. Bright star, goal of my yearning eyes as thou above me beamest, when thou shalt hide thee from my sight I'll know that death is near me. The singer had got so far when it struck Dorothea that it was not fair to let Clara miss hearing such a sweet voice, so, shaking her from side to side, she woke her, saying, Forgive me, child, for waking thee, but I do so that thou mayest have the pleasure of hearing the best voice thou hast ever heard, perhaps, in all thy life. Clara awoke quite drowsy, and not understanding at the moment what Dorothea said, asked her what it was, she repeated what she had said, and Clara became attentive at once but she had hardly heard two lines, as the singer continued, when a strange trembling seized her, as if she were suffering from a severe attack of court and ague, and throwing her arms round Dorothy as she said, Ah, dear lady of my soul and life! Why did you wake me? The greatest kindness fortune could do me now would be to close my eyes, and ears so as neither to see or hear that unhappy musician. What art thou talking about, child? said Dorothea. Why, they say this singer is a muleteer. Don Quixote Chapter 43 338 Nay, he is the lord of many places, replied Clara, and that one in my heart which he holds so firmly shall never be taken from him, unless he be willing to surrender it. Dorothea was amazed at the ardent language of the girl, for it seemed to be far beyond such experience of life as her tender years gave any promise of, so she said to her. You speak in such a way that I cannot understand you, Sonora Clara. Explain yourself more clearly, and tell me what is this you are saying about hearts and places and this musician whose voice has so moved you. But do not tell me anything now. I do not want to lose the pleasure I get from listening to the singer by giving my attention to your transports for I perceive he is beginning to sing a new strain and a new air. Let him, in heaven's name, return Clara, and not to hear him she stopped both ears with her hands, at which Dorothea was again surprised, but turning her attention to the song she found that it ran in this fashion. Sweet hope, my stay, that onward to the goal of thy intent dost make thy way, heedless of hindrance or impediment, have thou no fear if at each step thou findest death is near. No victory, no joy of triumph doth the faint heart know, unblessed is he that a bold front to fortune dares not show, but soul and sense in bondage yieldeth up to indolence. If love is wares do dearly sell, his right must be contest, what gold compares with that whereon his stamp he hath impressed? And all men know what costeth little that we rate, but lo! Love resolute knows not the word impossibility, and though my suit be set by endless obstacles I see, yet no despair shall hold me bound to earth while heaven is there. Here the voice ceased and Clara's sobs began afresh, all which excited Dorothea's curiosity to know what could be the cause of singing so sweet and weeping so bitter, so she again asked her what it was she was going to say before. On this Clara, afraid that Lucinda might overhear her, Winding her arms tightly round Dorothea put her mouth so close to her ear that she could speak without fear of being heard by anyone else and said. This singer, dear Sonora, is the son of a gentleman of Aragon, lord of two villages, who lives opposite my father's house at Madrid, and though my father had curtains to the windows of his house in winter, and lattice minus work in summer, in some way minus I know not how minus this gentleman, who was pursuing his studies, saw me, whether in church or elsewhere, I cannot tell, and in fact, fell in love with me, and gave me to know it from the windows of his house, with so many signs and tears that I was forced to believe him, and even to love him, without knowing what it was he wanted of me. One of the signs he used to. Don Quixote Chapter 43 339 Make me was to link one hand in the other, to show me he wished to marry me, and though I should have been glad if that could be, being alone and motherless I knew not whom to open my mind to, and so I left it as it was, showing him no favor, except when my father, and his two, were from home, to raise the curtain or the lattice a little, and let him see me plainly, at which he would show such delight that he seemed as if he were going mad. Meanwhile the time for my father's departure arrived, which he became aware of, but not for me, for I had never been able to tell him of it. He fell sick, of grief I believe, and so the day we were going away I could not see him to take farewell of him, were it only with the eyes. 
But after we had been two days on the road, on entering the posada of a village a day's journey from this, I saw him at the inn door in the dress of a muleteer, and so well disguised, that if I did not carry his image graven on my heart it would have been impossible for me to recognize him. But I knew him, and I was surprised, and glad, he watched me, unsuspected by my father, from whom he always hides himself when he crosses my path on the road, or in the posadas where we halt, and, as I know what he is, and reflect that for love of me he makes this journey on foot in all this hardship, I am ready to die of sorrow, and where he sets foot there I set my eyes. I know not with what object he has come, or how he could have got away from his father, who loves him beyond measure, having no other heir, and because he deserves it, as you will perceive when you see him. And moreover, I can tell you, all that he sings is out of his own head, for I have heard them say he is a great scholar and poet, and what is more, every time I see him or hear him sing I tremble all over, and am terrified lest my father should recognize him and come to know of our loves. I have never spoken a word to him in my life, and for all that I love him, so that I could not live without him. This, dear Sonora, is all I have to tell you about the musician whose voice has delighted you so much and from it alone you might easily perceive he is no muleteer, but a lord of hearts and towns, as I told you already. Say no more, Dona Clara, said Dorothea at this, at the same time kissing her a thousand times over, say no more, I tell you, but wait till day comes, when I trust in God to arrange this affair of yours so that it may have the happy ending such an innocent beginning deserves. Ah, Sonora, said Dona Clara, what end can be hoped for when his father is of such lofty position, and so wealthy, that he would think I was not fit to be even a servant to his son, much less wife? And as to marrying without the knowledge of my father, I would not do it for all the world. I would not ask anything more than that this youth should go back and leave me, perhaps with not seeing him, and the long distance we shall have to travel, the pain I suffer now may become easier, though I dare say the remedy I propose will do me very little good. I don't know how the devil this has come about, or how this love I have for him got in. I such a young girl, and he such a mere boy, for I verily believe we are both of an age, and I am not sixteen yet, for I will be sixteen Michaelmas day, next, my father says. Don Quixote Chapter 43 340 Dorothea could not help laughing to hear how like a child Dona Clara spoke. Let us go to sleep now, Sonora, said she, for the little of the night that I fancy is left to us, God will soon send us daylight, and we will set all to rights, or it will go hard with me. With this they fell asleep, and deep silence reigned all through the inn. The only persons not asleep were the landlady's daughter and her servant Maritorns, who, knowing the weak point of Don Quixote's humor, and that he was outside the inn mounting guard in armor and on horseback, resolved, the pair of them, to play some trick upon him, or at any rate to amuse themselves for a while by listening to his nonsense. As it so happened there was not a window in the hole and that looked outwards except a hole in the wall of a straw minus loft through which they used to throw out the straw. At this hole the two demi minus damsels posted themselves, and observed Don Quixote on his horse, leaning on his pike and from time to time sending forth such deep and doleful sighs, that he seemed to pluck up his soul by the roots with each of them, and they could hear him too, saying in a soft, tender, loving tone. O my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, perfection of all beauty, summit and crown of discretion. Treasure house of grace, depository of virtue and finally, ideal of all that is good, honorable, and delectable in this world. What is thy grace doing now? Art thou, perchance, mindful of thy enslaved knight who of his own free will hath exposed himself to so great perils, and all to serve thee? Give me tidings of her, O luminary of the three faces. Perhaps at this moment, envious of hers, thou art regarding her, either as she paces to and fro some gallery of her sumptuous palaces, or leans over some balcony, meditating how, whilst preserving her purity and greatness, she may mitigate the tortures this wretched heart of mine endures for her sake, what glory should recompense my sufferings, what repose my toil, and lastly what death my life, and what reward my services. And thou, O son, that art now doubtless harnessing thy steeds in haste to rise betimes and come forth to see my lady. When thou sayest her I entreat of thee to salute her on my behalf, but have a care when thou sh shalt see her and salute her, that thou kiss not her face, for I shall be more jealous of thee than thou wert of that light minus footed ingrate that made thee sweat and run so on the plains of Thessaly, or on the banks of the Peneus, for I do not exactly recollect where it was thou didst run on that occasion, in thy jealousy and love. Donkey
Lady Hody had got so far in his pathetic speech when the landlady's daughter began to signal to him, saying, Senor, come over here please. At these signals and voice Don Quixote turned his head and saw by the light of the moon, which then was in its full splendor, that someone was calling to him from the hole in the wall, which seemed to him to be a window, and what is more, with a gilt grating, as rich castles, such as he believed the inn to be, ought to have, and it immediately suggested itself to his imagination that, as on the former occasion, the fair damsel, the daughter of the lady of the castle, overcome by love for him, was once more endeavoring to win his affections, and with this idea, not to show himself discourteous, or ungrateful, he turned Rocinante's head, and approached the hole, and as he perceived the two wenches he said. Don Quixote Chapter 43 341 I pity you, beauteous lady, that you should have directed your thoughts of love to a quarter from whence it is impossible that such a return can be made to you as is due to your great merit and gentle birth, for which you must not blame this unhappy knight minus errant whom love renders incapable of submission to any other than her whom, the first moment his eyes beheld her, he made absolute mistress of his soul. Forgive me, noble lady, and retire to your apartment, and do not, by any further declaration of your passion, compel me to show myself more ungrateful, and if, of the love you bear me, you should find that there is anything else in my power wherein I can gratify you, provided it be not love itself, demand it of me, for I swear to you by that sweet absent enemy of mine to grant it this instant, though it be that you require of me a lock of Medusa's hair, which was all snakes, or even the very beams of the sun shut up in a vial. My mistress wants nothing of that sort, Sir Knight, said Meritorns at this. What then, discreet dame, is it that your mistress wants, replied Don Quixote. Only one of your fair hands, said Meritorns, to enable her to vent over it the great passion passion which has brought her to this loophole, so much to the risk of her honor. For if the lord her father had hurt her, the least slice he would cut off her would be her ear. I should like to see that tried, said Don Quixote, but he had better beware of that, if he does not want to meet the most disastrous end that ever father in the world met for having laid hands on the tender limbs of a love minus stricken daughter. Meritorns felt sure that Don Quixote would present the hand she had asked, and making up her mind what to do, she got down from the hole, and went into the stable, where she took the halter of Sancho Panza's ass, and in all haste returned to the hole, just as Don Quixote had planted himself standing on Rocinante's saddle in order to reach the grated window where he supposed the lovelorn damsel to be, and giving her his hand. He said, Lady, take this hand, or rather this scourge of the evil minus doers of the earth, take, I say, this hand which no other hand of woman has ever touched, not even hers who has complete possession of my entire body. I present it to you, not that you may kiss it, but that you may observe the contexture of the sinews, the close network of the muscles, the breadth and capacity of the veins, whence you may infer what must be the strength of the arm that is such a hand. That we shall see presently, said Meritorns, and making a running knot on the halter, she passed it over his wrist and coming down from the hole tied the other end very firmly to the bolt of the door of the straw minus loft. Don Quixote, feeling the roughness of the rope on his wrist, exclaimed, Your grace seems to be grating rather than caressing my hand. Treat it not so harshly, for it is not to blame for the offense my resolution has given you, nor is it just to wreak all your vengeance. 